There have been shipwrecks and things that have caused more deaths, but it was the biggest single loss of life in an event like this. It was very common understanding at the time that this was a direct punishment from God. On the night of December 26th in 1811, the Placide and Green Theater Company was doing a performance. It was a Thursday night, and it was the place to be in Richmond. And it was during the legislative session, so there were lots of people who were coming in from outside of Richmond uh, to visit, and the theater was packed. The theater was one of the social centers of the city. And so the performance that evening attracted a crowd of almost 600 people. And this is a city of population of 10,000. So you can, you can imagine what, uh, what kind of a hot ticket this must have been. Even though some people suspected that it might have been uh, part of a slave revolt, it actually was a complete accident. Now this is in the days before electricity. It's in the days before gas lighting. So apparently there was a light fixture, some sort of a chandelier that had oil lamps in it. The crew had failed to extinguish the chandelier completely. So it was raised up into the fly of the theater before the fire was out. And uh, hanging above were dozens of uh, oil painted hemp scenes. And they caught fire very quickly. It spread all through the fly then went up to the roof, and from there and uh, just completely encompassed the whole building. It had just an open um, uh, ceiling. Just you saw the, the rafters up above, and on top of that were just pine shingles, which apparently just went up like a, you know, like a torch. So the flames went up this scenery, across the ceiling, and pretty soon the entire uh, roof and ceiling structure was, was on fire. The way the theater was laid out, um, they had one main entrance and exit uh, where most of the, the attendees would have entered. Um, this had uh, inward opening doors, and uh, the people who sat down in the pit, the less expensive seats, would have entered through that way. And then all of the people who sat in the box seats, there were three levels of box seats on the sides, uh, and, and everyone who sat there would have entered through the main doors also. There was a narrow winding staircase that would take them up the different levels. And um, from there they would get off and go into very narrow hallways and then into their box seats. And then there was a separate entrance on the outside for those who sat in the gallery. And those would mostly be um, blacks, slave or free. Um, they would sit up there. Also people who were past the fringes of respectability. The, the gallery was also known as the third tier and uh, it was a place where historically prostitutes would have, would have been seated and um, so they had their own entrance and exit so that there wouldn't be any mixing with the other people who came to the theater that night. So when the theater fire began, uh, everyone who was seated in the pit could quickly evacuate. They could just go out the main exit. They were on the same level. People in the gallery could fairly easily get out down the staircase to exit. People in the boxes, the most expensive seats, they found it very difficult to leave. They had to go through these narrow hallways where people said uh, two could scarcely pass each other easily. So a lot of the deaths came uh, because people got trapped and crushed or overcome by smoke with trying to get out of the building rather than just being caught by the flames uh, themselves. So it was really a lack of um, really good design of the structure that probably ended up costing a great number of the people their lives. If there's a sort of a hero to the fire, it's probably Gilbert Hunt, who was an enslaved man. He was a blacksmith. He had been at church that evening for a late night service and he walked back to the Mayo family's home afterwards to see his wife. And as he approached the home, Mrs. Mayo came running out and she was screaming that my daughter's in the, in the theater, my daughter's in the fire. So Gilbert Hunt turned around as quickly as he could, ran back to the site of the theater 
Um, he looked for a mattress first to try to find something that people could land on if they were jumping from the windows, which they were in large numbers at that time. I then got a stepladder and placed it against the walls of the burning building. The door was too small to let the crowd, pushed forward by the scorching flames, to get out, and numbers of them were madly leaping from the windows, only to be crushed to death by the fall. I looked up and saw a doctor standing near one of the top windows and calling to me to catch the ladies as he handed them down. Out from one of the windows popped Dr. James McCaw, and he was said to be the very model of Hercules. He was a big man, and he was very strong. And from the window, he spotted Gilbert Hunt, called out to him, and the two of them formed a sort of relay team. And uh, together, they saved probably upwards of a dozen women from the window on that side of the building. The scene surpassed anything I ever saw. The wild shrieks of hopeless agony, the piercing cry, Lord, save or I perish, the uplifted hand, the earnest prayer for mercy, for pardon, for salvation. Gilbert Hunt was the man who ended up saving James McCaw's life. When he leapt from the window, when the fire began to get too close, um, he got stuck, part of his Part of his riding costume got stuck on a window and when it ripped free he crashed to the ground and when he touched the ground i thought he was dead he could not move an inch no one was near him for the wall above was tottering like a drunken man ready at any moment to fall and crush him to death i heard him scream out will nobody save me and at the risk of my own life i rushed to him and bore him away to a place of safety he was definitely one of the big heroes of the evening. Later on in life, he had actually purchased his own freedom and had fallen on hard times uh, economically. And there was a book that was printed essentially to benefit him in his old age. The proceeds of the book went to, to Gilbert Hunt uh, to help him support himself because he was considered sort of a, a local hero and celebrity for his work. And interestingly, he also um, also did something similar when the Virginia Penitentiary in Richmond catches on fire. He goes and helps save some inmates uh, who were um, trying to escape the flames inside the penitentiary. Of course, I don't think anyone raised money, though, to uh, memorialize his efforts to save prisoners, but they did to save the theater goers in 1811. The official death count is 72, and we know that there were um, others who died in the weeks after the fire. Um, but those who they were able to identify were about 72 people. The fire that takes place is really a, a milestone in Richmond's history, and to that point was the worst disaster in um, U.S. history in terms of loss of life in, a, in a, an urban place. There have been shipwrecks and things that have caused more deaths, but it was the biggest single loss of life in an event like this, and so it not only had profound effects on Richmond, but really sent shockwaves up and down the eastern seaboard. One of the things that really struck people and that stirred up a lot of sympathy for Richmond and for um, the survivors was the fact that so many women had died. These were um, mothers and grandmothers and also a lot of young teenagers. So the idea of all of these women perishing uh, was, uh, was just a heartbreaking thing for Americans and for others in the world to learn about after it happened. Well, you, you hear things that suggest that men were quick to run out of the church, um, or out of the theater, excuse me. I don't know whether that's true or not. Uh, certainly women, uh, women's clothing was more um, uh, flammable. There was a lot more of it, and I think there were certainly accounts of women's clothing catching on fire. Uh, which might have made it more difficult. Um, also, there was uh, you know, a chance that there were more women than men to begin with in the church. The theater was definitely a very popular social scene for men and women, but I think especially women who really uh, wanted that opportunity in the holiday time to get out and do something like this. So I don't think we can truly explain it, and I think it's probably not fair to point to dastardly, nefarious deeds by men rushing to get out. But it is remarkable that I think something like 54 of the 72 bodies that are finally recovered are women. 
Most of the people who were identified were identified by things that they were wearing. Uh, so for instance, the governor of Virginia, Governor George Smith, um, at the time, ruffled collars were fashionable. And so he had a high collar and he had a special buckle that he wore to keep it fastened. He was, he was um, identified by that. He had been governor for exactly three weeks. He'd taken the place of James Monroe, who had gone to Washington, D.C. to be the new Secretary of State for James Madison. The story about Governor Smith is that he was there and managed to escape. He was seen outside of the theater after the fire started, and so um, we know that he managed to get out, but he went back in for some reason. Um, in all of the confusion, he probably thought someone from his family was still inside. That's the story you hear about several several people who returned to the fire to save loved ones only to die themselves. Lieutenant James Gibbon and Sally Conyers, who died in each other's arms, she was identified by a necklace and he by the, the buttons and the jacket that he was wearing. Sally Conyers was the adopted daughter of a local mill owner. She was, by all accounts, a very lovely, modest, accomplished young woman. She could sing beautifully. Um, she was very popular. And uh, at the time of the fire, she was about 19 years old and really one of Richmond's leading bells. One of her neighbors was Lieutenant James Gibbon. He was the son of a war hero during the Revolutionary War. So also from a very privileged family and distinguished family in Richmond. Among the names of some of the sufferers I observed, Miss Conyers and Lieutenant Gibbon, who lost his life in attempting to save hers, he had got clear from the house and saved his mother's life with his own. But finding that Miss Conyers was left behind, he rushed into the blazing building in search of her and was never seen more. Both perished in the flames, dreadful scene. Horrors that language has no terms to represent. One story relates that he had some sort of premonition or was not interested in coming to the theater that night. And so Sally went with some friends without him. Lieutenant Gibbon arrived late to the theater with his friend James Lynch. And the two of them sat leaning over the box talking to Sally when the cry of fire was heard. And when chaos broke out in the theater, the two of them reached over and together pulled Sally up. She had fainted. And so uh, together they tried to struggle with her toward the door. And Lieutenant Gibbon uh, yelled to his friend, uh, leave Sally to me. She's light. I can carry her. You can help somebody else. And that was the last thing he was ever heard to say. The story goes that when the fire is finally put out, the two of them are found embracing, the two bodies are found embracing each other in the, in the ruins of the, of the theater. I think their story and their romance made the tragedy of the theater fire real to many people. The burial committee decided that they were not going to try to move the bodies, that instead they were going to bury them on site. And so they uh, constructed a mass grave and they put the bodies in two mahogany coffins and they buried them where they fell. There's a brick crypt in the basement of Monumental Church on Broad Street, and that is where the actual remains are. So this is Monumental Church, and it sits on the site of the Richmond Theater, which in 1811 uh, burned down on December 26th during a fire. 72 Richmonders perished in the fire that night, and to honor their lives, they constructed a church here in 1814. John Marshall, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, spearheaded the uh, fundraising effort and thus uh, took three years, but they did build the church here. It was Richmond's second Episcopalian church in the city at the time, and it remained a church until 1965. It was built by Robert Mills, who is most well known for being the architect of the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. In the front of the church, uh, there is a, is a portico, and in that portico is a monument, and it's a sculpture that features an urn, has the names of the victims carved into it all the way around. The way that it's done reflects the social realities of the day. The most prominent placement was on the side that faced Broad Street, 
and that has all the names of the men who died. And the other three sides have the names of the women, and on the very bottom are all of the black and mixed race victims. Even in death, even though they were all in a common grave, um, the way that they're remembered still highlights their social differences. I think it seemed natural to build um, a solemn, consecrated spot um, in that location. Also, I think uh, Richmond at the time, which seems kind of strange to think about now, as it is a city that's full of churches, did not have many churches. There were really only four churches in town at the time. And so there was a real need for worship spaces in the city, and it seemed like a um, very appropriate thing for the city fathers to do and actually spend city money doing, which is what they did. There was already an existing group of people that were trying to build a church in the area. They already had some funds and finances, and it would be, I think, a little easier to get the memorial finished by combining forces and creating something that would kill two birds with one stone. It would be a beautiful church for the people of Richmond and also be a memorial to the people who died in this horrible fire. And so after this point, the sort of evangelical spirit really pervades Richmond in a much more serious way, and you start to see you know, great, greater attention being paid to um, you know, going to church and having revivals and these sorts of things. So when they build a church on the spot of the uh, theater, I don't think it's, I think that's not coincidental. It's part of sort of this Richmonders beginning to look in and saying, okay, did we do something to cause this? It was a very common understanding at the time that this was a direct punishment from God. Either God was angry at America in general for something that they'd done, or that God was angry for the people in Richmond in particular for something that they had done. Um, different sermons suggest that Richmond was being punished for slavery. Uh, others suggest that they were being punished for um, being such fans of the theater because that was considered to be sinful entertainment. So there were a lot of reasons why people thought that this disaster came from the hand of God. Broadsides in our collection at the Virginia Historical Society show you the evidence of just how people used this event to talk about how the fire may have been God's way of punishing Richmond for its sins, its lack of commitment to, to faith, and instead spending a lot of time doing things like going to the theater and dancing and all this sort of frivolous behavior that kept you from um, what more serious religious people thought was the proper kind of behavior. Richmond um, does not have a theater until 1819, but it begins to have churches before that. So there's a sort of an interesting way that the citizens, I think, are viewing the events. We always tend to remember the most recent disaster or the biggest disaster. So, you know, I mean, very few people know of you know, the big earthquake that almost levels Charleston in the 1880s, Charleston, South Carolina, because in 1903, a bigger one happens in San Francisco that literally destroys the city. We don't tend to remember them much because they get eclipsed by other disasters. That's the unfortunate sort of nature of, of life, I guess.